here at Books and Books. So welcome, and I hope you're all very, very excited to uh, greet Mr. Ridley for tonight. So thank you all for joining us. <laughs> thank you all for joining us, and thanks to our internet audience for tuning in with us. You're all in for a great treat for tonight, and you can keep up with all our events online, or for those of you who are here, you can pick up a calendar and at the register so you can enjoy more of the author events that we have here. Those of you online, if you would like to purchase a book and have it personalized by Mr. Pearson, call the number on your screen and we will ship it to you wherever you are in the US. We look forward to hearing from you. Now, for about our author for tonight. Ridley Pearson is an award-winning author of multiple adult adventure series for young readers and adults alike. He was born in Riverside, Connecticut and went to school at the University of Kansas and Brown University. <laughs> in 1991, he was the first American citizen to be awarded the Raymond Chandler Fulbright Fellowship in Detective Fiction at Oxford University. His extensive library is not limited to Peter and the Starcatcher series, which is co-written by Dave Barry and Mr. Pearson, chronicling how Peter Pan became Peter Pan, which was actually turned into a Tony Award nominated musical. So if anyone wants to check it out, it's a great musical. I had a great time watching it. And some musical, th musical theater trivia. It is the first musical to get the most nominations in Tony history, which is nine. So now you have a little bit of trivia behind your belt. So, but for tonight, let's showcase and start talking about The Kingdom Keepers, which is why we're all here. So it's a riveting seven book adventure set in Disney. It's set in the Disney parks full of Disney adventures and villains called the Overtakers, such as Maleficent, Corella de Vil, and Cherbourg. And today we say goodbye to Finn, Philby, Willa, Charlene, and Maybeck as they embark on their final Disney adventure set in Disneyland. The King to Keeper's senior year in high school is almost over. For more than three years, things have been very quiet. Their battles are long behind them. They agree the threat to the Disney realm silenced, albeit at a great cost. But inside the catacombs of the Aztec temple, where Finn Whitman faced down his nemesis, the monstrous Chernobog, a new threat brews. Deception and betrayal rock the Kingdom Keepers as the merciless group called the Overtakers stage an unexpected comeback. But a discovery by the Kingdom Keepers provides them with one hope, a victory, a last, a lost icon. It is believed to be gone forever. The keepers have one last chance to preserve the heart of the kingdom Disneyland from a terrifying destruction decades in the making. So let's give a warm and loud books and books welcome to Mr. Ridley Pearson. I, it's, it's a little weird to ask this in South Florida, but how many of you have been to Disney World? <laughs> oh! So um, I, uh, I want to thank Books and Books, and I really want to thank you all for coming out on a Wednesday night when there's a lot better things to do than see some old geezer talk about his book. So. I, uh, I really, really appreciate it. I've got a family, and I know how hard it is to just get into the living room together, much less down to a book signing. So thanks very much for making that effort and coming. It means the world to me. And by supporting Books and Books, you support the future of writing. Barnes & Noble, love them. They're going to put my kids through college. But when you support Books and Books, they're the people, Mitchell and company, are the people who brought me in when I had my first book. Uh, and they, they like what they see and they take a chance and five people come and 20 years later, 150 people come. But that's because you guys come. So keep an eye on their schedule, support the stuff you love, but also support the stuff you don't know that well because you may discover some amazing stories and writers that you didn't even know were out there. Um, I have had the most amazing opportunity thanks to the Walt Disney Company um, in that they had recognized my uh, adult thrillers and asked me if I could write a crime novel or a series of novels if we had some success with it 
uh, that would be adventure novels set in their own theme parks. And their requirement was their attorneys had to approve it. <laughs> and that turned out to be a big challenge. Um, so I said yes, but the way I write my crime novels is I load them with fact, because I think it's better for readers to read the truth than all the made-up stuff. So if I was to do this, I would need to gain full access to your theme parks. And they said, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> and I said, OK, but you know, that really would be how I'd have to do it, because I generally report on what I see, um, whether it's you know, going in my crime novels to a, a prison of the criminally insane, or in this case, trying to report what it's like behind the scenes at Disney. And they called back about a month later and said, OK, we give in. Uh, we've granted you full access to the theme parks. So they gave me a VIP pass that gets me and my family into any Disney property around the world whenever we want to go. And when I call ahead, they assign a Disney Imagineer, who are the people that dream up the next big cool thing in the parks, to be my guide. Um, so the first time I went um, for the first book, which later became called Disney After Dark when we realized it was going to be a series, um, was I think that first day I went into Splash Mountain and um, Pirates of the Caribbean and It's a Small World. And those of you who have read the series uh, probably sense that when I went into Small World, it was 5 o'clock in the morning, the lights were out, the music was off, the dolls were all frozen, <laughs> which was really weird. And um, it, so it was freaky and eerie to begin with. And we got about three scenes in, and you know, there must be 2,000 dolls in that thing or something, and they're all dressed up in these cute little costumes from around the world, and they all sing this obnoxious song <laughs> over and over and over. And just by saying, it's a small world, you will go to bed with that song in your head. It never leaves you. Um, so that wasn't on. The song wasn't on. The dolls were frozen. We were under emergency lighting. And um, out of my, the corner of my eye, Two of the dolls went like that, and I freaked out. I jumped five feet out of the boat, crashed back down. The Imagineer I was with said, you know, what was that about? And I went, <laughs> you know, and, and tried to mutter something. And when I finally said, two of those dolls just moved, he said, Ridley, this ride is shut off. Nothing moved. You know, relax. Uh, but I saw two of the dolls move. And, and I did. I saw two of the dolls move. I've since had other people tell me they've seen four of the dolls move when it shut off, so I was lucky. Um, but I, I had my author's notebook with me, and I observe, and I take notes, and so I wrote down two of the dolls move. Um, the way I met Dave Barry, the incredible Dave Barry, was, uh, yeah, you guys have a prize here in Dave Barry. Funniest, smartest, most generous man you'll ever meet. But... Uh, the way I met Dave was in this crazy rock and roll band with Amy Tan and Scott Turow and, and James McBride and Roy Blunt Jr. and Stephen King uh, and Dave Barry. And so I was typing away my scene where the dolls moved, and I said, and two of the dolls moved. And then I backspaced and said, no, four of the dolls moved. And then I said, wait, I'm in a band with Stephen King. All of the dolls moved. <laughs> so the, the dolls break off this plywood platform, and they, they march like Chucky. And they cruise along, and then they dive into the water, and they, they swim like robots, and they snap at these kids, and that's my vision of It's a Small World. Um, it'll never be the same. So it's just, you know, those kinds of experiences, and I've just had them time and time again. I've gone backstage at Disney 25, 26 times now, thanks to the generosity of the company. Um, and I'm just going to give you a quick run through of the various books. And um, the second novel is set in Animal Kingdom, 2,500 animals, most of whom are taken out of the park at night and groomed and doctored and fed and petted. Uh, but some remain. And I ended up on the savanna of the safari. And um, it was, you know, it was empty and quiet. And I was snooping around and taking my notes. They'd driven me out there with a ranger. And he said, the only thing is, you've got to be back by 6. You've got to be back by 6. You know, well, I got completely carried away. I, knew, I had no track of time. And all of a sudden, I heard this... And it was like this Jurassic Park moment. I look up, and all these Thompson gazelles are coming right at me. I'm running out of there, going, get the car started! Um, you know, not, not what you want to be doing at 4.30 in the morning. But um, they also let me on to Expedition Everest, 
Uh, they had the person who had engineered and overseen the construction of it. It's actually three structures in one. And I'm a techie guy, so I loved all of the engineering and, and the way they, you know, churn us up and turn us over. Um, so we walked, uh, starting at about 5 in the morning, we walked all through this, all the way up to the peak, and, and by, followed, the, followed the track the whole way on staircases. It took about two and a half hours. And at the end of it, he said, now I'm going to bring in some cast members, and we're going to turn it on, and you can ride it. And I said, well, that would be great, except that's what I said. That's exactly what I said. I said, that would be great, but ah! Because I don't do roller coasters. And uh, he said, I got up at four in the morning. You're doing my roller coaster. And uh, they put me on the roller coaster alone. And I could see all these adults down on the platform just snickering as they heard me going, help, help. <laughs> because I just, I can't do roller coasters. Um, so, you know, you're going bombing around and up and down and over and under. And then all of a sudden you zip out of the entire mountain and the track is broken and you're hanging 150 feet off the ground and I am shrieking at the top of my lungs. They switch the track behind you and it backs up at 45 miles an hour in the dark and a giant beast comes down and picks your nose. At that point, I needed to change my underwear. That was not fun. Um, it then pulls two loops and literally your teeth are in one zip code and your ears are in another. <laughs> Um, and I got off of this thing, I'm not an alcohol drinker, and I got off this thing and I was staggering around the whole day. It was, it was an embarrassing moment. Um, they let me into Epcot for book three, um, which has become one of my favorite parks. And uh, there are things like VIP lounges that you never see. They let me backstage where they load all the pyrotechnics for illuminations. Um, it was just amazing. And they let me into Test Track where there were crash test dummies, and I immediately said, wait, those look like dolls. And so I had them come alive. Uh, and they, they climb onto segways and chase the kingdom keepers around the parks. Um, they let me into Disney Hollywood Studios, which played a huge role for me. The Kingdom Keepers is a book series now that puts five teenagers inside the Disney kingdoms after dark when the parks are closed, just as I was doing on my research. And one of the things I have to deal with is there are Disney villains who want to take over, the overtakers, they want to take over the magic of the park, so it's a much more nasty place than what we want it to be. And the Kingdom Keepers are sort of caught in the middle of this thing and want to help stop it. But I needed a place to hide my villains, because you can't have a costumed Maleficent and the real Maleficent walking around at the same time. And in Fantasmic, uh, they have all the Disney villains, so, especially the ones I use, including Chernabog, the dragon, Maleficent. Um, it was a, a great place for me to hide my villains. So I asked if I could go backstage at Fantasmic. And they said, we're supposed to let you do whatever you want to do. So um, I climbed backstage at Fantasmic, went to, uh, onto all the levels, the zip lines, all of that stuff that they do up there. Uh, and while I was there, I ran into some representatives of our government who happened to train with Disney because Disney has the largest stash of ordnance next to the U.S. military of anyone in the country. And they do such a good job with safety, the government comes down and really learns from them how you can do safety well with ordnance. Um, so that's your Disney dollar working hard for you. Um, the, probably the most fun I've had was that... Uh, Disney allowed me onto their cruise ships. Big mistake. Um, they let me into the engine room, into the communications room, into the security room. Um, they let me into the galleys where they prepare the meals. Some quick math. 3,000 passengers, 2,000 crew, which is why it's so fun. Um, 5,000 people, three meals a day. 15,000 meals. They actually prepare 21,000 meals a day on these ships. The engine room has three generators. Each generator is capable of powering a city of 20,000 people. Um, I mean, these things are floating cities and big cities at that. Uh, and they let me in all over the place to the point where some of the officers in their crisp whites who are showing me through would go, this is way cool, I've never been here. <laughs> 
I, that scout's honor. Uh, and I went, wow, this really is cool. Um, I mean, for instance, in the engine room, you would be happy to eat your meal off the floor of the engine room. It is that clean. I don't know if you've ever been in ships. Ships aren't usually that clean. This thing is like clean with toothbrushes. You know, it's the kind of place you drop your sandwich, you just lie down and eat it. You wouldn't even pick it up. Um, so they offered me a 15-night cruise to get my Kingdom Keepers from Cape Canaveral to Los Angeles through the Panama Canal. Um, I accepted. Uh, I have a weakness for Disney cruises, it's true. Um, and we went to Aruba. We went to Costa Rica on zip lines. We went into Mexico and saw temples and more zip lines. We went on to Baja. I kayaked. I did all this stuff. And every second of the way, when I wasn't running around an engine room, I was taking notes on what I did on all these cruises. And um, it was such a massive story that I called my editor and said, you know, I'm ready to write book five, but it's going to be like 800 pages. Um, so I would rather write book five, part one, and book five, part two. And they said, how about you write book five and book six? <laughs> so that's what we did. But I left something called a cliffhanger at the end of book five. Something I will never do again. Because I had approximately 6,000 kids stand outside my front door with aluminum <laughs> baseball bats threatening to break my knees if I didn't publish the sixth book faster. Um, so I'm just not going to do that again. Uh, all the books stand alone, but five and six really should be bought as a little two-book set uh, because they really are one massive book. Uh, and then we got to the seventh book. And this was, I, I believe in writing, for those who write short stories and fiction and books, I believe in writing a beginning, a middle, and an end to all of my stories, to all of my chapters in those stories, sometimes to all of the paragraphs in those chapters, and to all of the books in a series. So although some people in the business side of this wanted me to just you know, write 600 of these, I really saw that it had to be a complete story. It had to be its own story. And so I, I came sliding down the mountain into book seven, and by that point, uh, of course, I was many books in, and around book three or four, all of you wonderful people um, accelerated the sales of the series and got in touch with me. And it was the getting in touch with me that was so special, because I had young readers writing me and saying, I've read the third book seven times, and I love it. I've read the fourth book 11 times, and I love it. And I said, who am I? to write this seventh book without these incredible readers. You guys have read the books more than I have. <laughs> but I will say to all you readers, I have never turned in a book that's been accepted for publication that has gone less than four full drafts. Every sentence rewritten four times. So when you read a 300-page Kingdom Keepers, I've written 12 to 1,600 pages to get it published. Uh, my last thriller, Choke Point, which was published last June. I have a new one called The Red Room coming out. Choke Point was rewritten nine times, 6,000 pages to get a book published uh, because I want them as, as well-written and as good as I can make them. Um, so book seven was going to come up, and I felt it would be really improper to do this without my wonderful readers. And I didn't know how to do it because we live in a society where you can sue all the time. So... Um, it was actually a big concern, because otherwise I would have just said, email me all your ideas and I'll put them into a book. But what I found was a company willing to build an app. And we built a free app called Kingdom Keepers with an S Insider. And we opened it up for young and old readers of the series to come on and vote what direction you wanted me to write a chapter that week. And we started April 15th of last year, and we went through the end of September. And together, I was steered through about 35 chapters where this direction of the book should go. So I had the reader's input. At the same time every week, I would say, you know, this week, uh, an Aztec temple is going to crumble to the ground. What would that look like? And I would get readers writing with me to tell me what that would look like. And the best ones of those, I would cut and paste into the novel. So about 70 young readers and old readers alike have their work in the first third of the seventh book. And you'll see that 
with these tiny little KKs you'll read in there. I, I explain all the thing up front. The last two thirds, I had to write by myself. Um, <laughs> But it was an amazing experience, so we left it open. We do fan fiction every week, including I just, I just evaluated a bunch last night, um, and we're posting them today. And in about two weeks, we think, two to three weeks, we're going to start up the process again on another set of books I'm writing. Um, when I did this, I warned the people who were writing the app for Disney that I could only identify three or four hundred passionate readers who had emailed. I get, you know, five, 500 to 1,000 emails a week, but I could identify about three to 400 of you who were really, like, insane um, <laughs> and needed to be locked up. And, and so I said, you know, I, I can almost promise that we'll have three to 400 people on there participating with us. And they said, you know, you leave that to us. You just write the books. In other words, go into your corner and shut up. <laughs> um, so I did, and sure enough, I felt so proud because it came out, and that first week we had 300 users. And I said, what did Ridley tell you? The second week we had 1,200. The third week we had 9,000. The fourth week we had 25,000. Um, the sixth week we had 55,000. And we averaged about 55,000 registered users and 150,000 people on there every week voting things up. We had as many as 7,000 contributions a week. We had to hire an army of people to read them, including me, and promote them and vote them up to a group that I could really get serious about. But we do this still every week. We want you guys on there. We want you to be better, excited writers. So it's all free and it's all safe. You can imagine with Disney behind it. Um, so it's, it's, we, had to, we literally, at the end of this, we had all this parental permission. At the end, the... Um, the, the people at Disney had to hand walk these um, stamped or whatever, you know, notarized documents to a court in New York City and get, I mean, these things are sanitized. Um, so it is, it's great. And uh, I hope you guys will come on and, and keep participating. The seventh book goes to Disneyland, the source of it all. And for me, um, it was an eye-opener and, and a wonder to again get to go in time after time after time to all those closed uh, attractions and have them start them up for me and let me ride them. Uh, so a quick scan through a few of them, uh, the castle, that's actually Paris. And um, anybody know this? Tower of Terror. Yeah. In, in <laughs> That's Walt's apartment. They let me into Walt's apartment three or four times. We just shot a Disney 365, and part of it was shot in Walt's apartment, and that's airing right now. So if you happen to catch it, you'll see little glimpses of Walt's apartment that you will never get to see any other way. Um, we went to Storybook Land, where everything shrinks, including the Kingdom Keepers. One of the things people don't know about Disneyland is that in its early days, it was overrun ironically, by mice. Mickey Mouse is home. Um, and to combat it, rather than poison the mice, they brought in cats. So to this day, there's an army of feral cats that come back out into the park at night. Only at this point, the kingdom keepers have made themselves the size of a mouse. Not healthy. Um, this is their version of the Haunted Mansion. Uh, which here in Disney World I was let into twice with the lights on. Um, really terrifying. It's probably more scary with the lights on because it's so dark in there that half the time you don't see everything that's going on and then you suddenly see it and go, whoa, it's even freakier. Um, how many of you know the, the secret of her, the bride's necklace? Any of you know that? And the secret is? Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know the exact thing. You know the story that I'm the wife Right, the wife killed her husbands. So the first time you see her, she's standing there, and she has on a single um, pearl necklace, first husband down. The next time you see her, she has two necklaces on, second husband down. The scary part of seeing her in her bridal gown, she's wearing five necklaces. Not the marriage you want to make, if I may say. Psycho bride. Um, <laughs> I went to World of Color, which is an um, incredible water and, and light show with lasers. And I, had, uh, I have a, a wonderful young woman now working for me who's going to Pepperdine University. 
And she had made the suggestion that I find a way to get at least Finn, if not Finn and Amanda, because we all love Finn and Amanda, onto one of these plumes of water going 150 feet up to escape the villains. I managed it, so you got to read the book. Um, and it wouldn't be anything without Matterhorn, uh, which is an iconic ride in Disneyland. Uh, anybody know the secret of Matterhorn? No. Isn't there like a basketball There is a basketball court. Half court basketball uh, court in the, in the mountain up in here. And for years, they don't do it anymore, but for years the cast members on break would go up there and shoot hoops for exercise and have fun. There is also just above the curve of, uh, if I pulled this down, it wouldn't make any difference. It's a study of optics, ladies and gentlemen. Um, there is a flat surface on the very top that you can't see. The very, if you Google Earth this, you can see it. Um, there's a rubberized flat terrace on the very top of Matterhorn and to keep it from being struck by lightning. And uh, near the end of the book, um, Dear Finn ends up there at a time he should not end up there. My crime novels have, over the years, had the weird um, honor of predicting a particular crime or happening. I've written about 25 of them. Four or five or six of them have actually sort of predicted a crime coming. So I spend two years writing one of these books, and the week it publishes, the New York Times has a front page article on the same thing happening. It's been very, you know, woo. Um, and, and it had kind of gone away for a couple of books, and I was like, uh, But it came back in Kingdom Keeper 7, because um, last Friday night, I, I had done a series of uh, three big signings in Disney World, and I did a, a like number of signings in Disneyland, and I was exhausted, and I went to bed in the Disneyland Hotel at about 9.30, and I woke up, and then the second quake hit, and I was basically shook out of bed by a 7.4 earthquake uh, that rattled Southern California. And I turned on my television and said, an earthquake has hit Southern California. It has its epicenter in La Habra. Well, in the book, there's an earthquake with an epicenter in La Habra. <laughs> Scared the wajumunga out of me. Um, so you just never know. Um, we got an opportunity to tour Disneyland um, with a, a wonderful woman who has been the, um, she's been sort of the stylist of the whole park for 25 years. And she showed us tunnels and old structures. I don't know if you remember, but at one point there was, um, uh, what do you call them? You know, like when you ski and you're, you're carried along. Yeah, it's not a ski lift, but it's a... Uh, Four syllables sounds like <laughs> gondola. Yeah, there's like a gondola. There used to be a gondola sky passageway. Well, they left, and they're actually going to destroy it in the next six months. But for years, they have left the, uh, the, the sky flight or whatever they called it building up there. And it's just gotten more and more crumbled and awkward. And, and I saw it up through the woods, and I said, what is that to this woman? And she said, oh, you want to see that? It's falling down. I said, yes. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, it's got old code on it because they had done it up all, oh, it's so cool. So it plays a huge role in the book. Um, as do Amanda and Jess. Um, and I have fallen in love with Amanda. I um, tend to overwrite her, and I always have to take her, her pages out of the book because it'll call for like two paragraphs, and I'll write nine pages. I just have a mad crush on Amanda. Um, so to connect book six with book seven, since some time has passed, I wrote a short story, and it's published up on um, Kingdom Keepers Insider, and it's written from Jez's point of view. And the next one that I'm writing is written from Amanda's point of view, and then I hope to write a third one written from um, Maddie, uh, Maddie Weaver's point of view. Um, so I have had uh, just the ultimate time with this whole deal, and I've brought the series to a close. Uh, bring some hankies with you. And um, it's unfortunate because I'm on the air, but I'll do this anyway. I wasn't going to do this publicly, but there will be another three book Kingdom Keepers series. Um, I, I, do, I, I really do not want to be, and I'm striving not to be, one of those authors that writes the same story and just changes the title. 
I just don't like that. So I, as, as I, I, I really wanted to bring this story to a close, and it is to a close, but I would go around the country and I would ask audiences like this, if I had to write another series, would you rather it be The Kingdom Keepers or In the Parks? And every time it was split 50-50. Every, I must have asked this 50 times to huge crowds, and it was always exactly half and half, and I thought, but I don't want to write the same book over and over. Well, I found a way to keep most of the characters, and I found a way to keep the parks, but in a way you will not believe, at least I don't believe it, because I haven't figured it out yet. But um, <laughs> it's actually, I think, going to be really fun. It'll be a three-book series. I just can't leave these characters, because I absolutely love them. Um, again, many, many thanks for your taking the time to be with me. Uh, you just, you, you probably can't imagine how rewarding it is to have readers, to have them enthusiastic, to spread the word. It, uh, it means the world to me, and we're keeping this thing going. And uh, bless you all for doing that. Um, I'll take some questions. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yes? Did you ride Tinkerbell zipline? Did I ride Tinkerbell zipline? I have stood at the clip with the harness in my hand, and they said, no way, fat boy. Um, and I, I actually uh, tree climb. Uh, I climb really tall trees for recreation, and I once took your beloved Dave Barry on, that, on, on a tree climb in Idaho, and um, I had asked him the night that I picked him up at the airport, hey, you know, I was thinking of climbing a tree tomorrow. Do you want to? Well, he reported to me years later that he was like snickering, going, what a weirdo. Like, what are we, 10 years old or something? We're going to go out back and climb the apple tree? But being a polite guest, he said, sure. Um, so the next day, I drove him, you know, 30 miles into the Idaho wilderness and found this giant tree that leans like this. And he said, dude, wait. We've gone by six million worthy trees, and you're going to climb the one that's leaning? And, and I said, yes, I didn't tell him why. And we climbed up this tree. We went about 80, 90 feet up, and he was getting all ashen and perspiry. And, and I said, Dave, you OK? And he said, well, I didn't tell you I'm afraid of heights. And I said, well, you should have told me that, because we're going to jump out the tree and rappel out. That's how we leave the tree. And he said, dude, I am not jumping out of this tree. <laughs> And I said, yes, you are. And down Dave went. And so it was one of those things where only Dave Barry could have the worst day of his life and then write a column about it a month later that is the funniest thing. Google it. It is the funniest thing you have ever read. And I want to tell you, he did not have any fun that day, which just shows you the genius of Dave Barry. Um, so I can't remember your question, but yes. <laughs> Maybe no. Yes. How does the knight in the fifth book tie in with the image of Mickey that Minnie ripped up? Have you read the seventh book? Yes. Oh, I'm not going to answer that because there are other people. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. My daughter has spent time on her computer casting the movie yes. of these books. <laughs> is, is there Does she any, contact Alan Horn about that? <laughs> Is, is there any consideration about making a movie? That's a perfect word. There is consideration. There has been for probably six years. Um, they go in and out of it. They're out of it right now. Um, you know, you just can never tell in that business. But, and I've said this before, and it sounds incredibly self-serving, and it is. Uh, but the, the, the bigger the groundswell of novel sales, the more hysteria about the books, you know Disney, the more chance there is they'll do it. That, that's how I feel about it. And thankfully, you guys have really told your friends and are telling your friends and are you know, tweeting about it and Facebook, and we're getting a really big following for the Kingdom Keepers, which I think has, has awakened uh, the film studio and other parts. The park is interested in pieces of it. Um, there's, there's all sorts of stuff going. In fact, any of you who live here, which is probably every single one of you, um, I've written Kingdom Keepers quests for Disney's Youth Education Services, YES, up in Disney World. If you can bring a group of two families or a group from your school of 10 or more with one adult, you can take the Disney, uh, the Kingdom Keepers quest through YES. And I put you on puzzles and math problems and language arts, all of which I wrote. Uh, and you become a Kingdom Keeper going through the park. Um, they did it. And they, they asked me to do it because I love education. And I said, I would love to do this. And we didn't know if 50 people, well, now tens of thousands of people have done it. And it got so popular 
that in about eight days they're opening the second one in Animal Kingdom. So there'll be one in Magic Kingdom, one in Animal Kingdom. So they're, they're available through YES. They give you a discounted ticket and then you go in. It takes about four hours. It's half your day. Uh, you can ride rides as you do it, but that's not required. Basically, it's required that you think hard and try to solve puzzles, which is why you have to have at least 10 because you need two groups of five. It's just like the Kingdom Keepers. You can't really, you can't do this alone. So um, if you ever want to do that, that's fun too. But yeah, we hope, uh, of course, I would love to see it either be a TV show or a, a movie or something just because it would, it would come alive. But it's already alive in my head, so that's all right. Yeah. Small world's anniversary tomorrow. How, how do I feel about it? It's a small world's anniversary. It's a small world's anniversary? Why am I not there? <laughs> I didn't even know that. Oh my gosh, I'll have to tweet like mad now. Um, I love that ride, by the way. And one of my favorite rides is Peter Pan's Flight. Um, you know, and it's a simple ride, but it's so cool. It's just so amazing. And Dave Barry and I, for Bridge to Neverland, which is a contemporary novel that ties into Peter and the Star Catchers, um, we had to set a, a particular scene in there, so they opened it up at 7 in the morning for us before the guests were in there. It was a really cold day, and we walked the whole ride at le- for a long time and took wild notes because it involves all this Einsteinian physics. And um, Yes, us, Einsteinian <laughs> physics. Um, and we got to the end of it, and they knew we wanted to ride it, so they turned it on, and we rode it, and they were all freezing out there, just dying to get to their break room, and uh, we went around and we said, just one more, because we couldn't do all our notes. Everything goes by so fast. And we came around again and we said, just one more. We wrote it 12 times. <laughs> Those people could have killed us. They were freezing in their socks by the time we were done. Yes? Who is the person on the cover of the seventh book? Little Queen. Little Queen. That's exactly right. Each of the books has a different villain's eyes on it. Yes? When you wrote with Dave Barry, how did the process go? When I wrote with Dave Barry, how did the process go? Dave's way. No. Um, <laughs> we um, outlined the book, which is something I really recommend until you're Stephen King. Um, and that was a word that Dave had never seen, and he had to look it up in the dictionary. Um, so we sat down at a kitchen table and spent about a week throwing ideas for scenes at each other, and, and even pieces of those scenes. So there were times that grown adults, Dave once said to me, you idiot, a mermaid wouldn't say that. <laughs> what? As if he knows what a mermaid. Um, and then I had read some um, books where people had collaborated, and I could really tell the difference between who was writing what, and it bummed me out, and I called Dave and said, you know, maybe this is a bad idea because we don't want to, you know, people to read this book that's just like A, B, A, B. Um, and so we, we sort of put the thing on hold for a few days and we both thought about it. One of us came up with the idea of dividing the book by character. So a certain individual would take the happy-go-lucky, childlike, funny characters and another certain individual would take the pathological, psycho, adult, <laughs> piratical characters. Um, and if chapter five was mostly the pirates, and you know, every chapter has everybody in it, but if it was mostly one way or the other, then that guy would write the first draft, uh, regardless of order, and send it to the other guy. And the other guy, unlike the proper New York way, which is you carefully read the book and send this very carefully worded letter, we would just completely carve up the other guy's work and send it back. And if you didn't want that pulled out, you would stick it back in. Um, and so it was a tug of war. We called it ping pong. Um, And that's the thing about what I was saying before is books aren't written, they're rewritten. So most of my books have been written six times. Dave and I commonly wrote seven to eight drafts of every chapter. It might take a month. And then we would move on to chapter six, and that would be the kids and Peter and all of that. And I would get it and butcher it and send it back to Dave, and he would butcher it back, and we'd go back and forth. And the great thing about that is when you write normally, it's a very solo quiet solitude and you never know if you're doing anything right. You're writing for months and you're thinking, Does all of, is all of this just awful? Uh, but when you're writing with a guy, especially as smart as Dave, and you're sending it back and forth on a, on a weekly if not daily basis, you're getting feedback and you're seeing what's worked, you're seeing what he pulled out, what he put in, 
and it's a really neat, intuitive way to write. I mean, we did it for 10 years. We're not doing it anymore, but we did it for 10 years, wrote 12 books together, and it was a remarkable experience, just fabulous. Yes? Your very first submission was it like a short story? To be published the first time? Mm -hmm. um, this is a sad story. I hope you have hankies. Uh, <laughs> I started writing when I was 10 years old by learning how to type. I taught myself through a, through a little how to book how to type on a manual typewriter. And I had nothing to practice my typing on. And I wanted to be a very fast typist. And I'm a very fast typist. And so I needed material to type. And I ended up just taking books off the bookshelf that I liked and typing them. And I think intuitively I began to find out how to tell a story. And then as I did that, I realized, wait a second, I could tell my own stories. So from about 10 to 15, um, I wrote maybe 50 or 100 what I'm sure are just horrible short stories. They're all gone somewhere. And then high school and college, too busy to do much of that, came out of college and I tried to be James Taylor. Um, I played acoustic rock and roll basically for 11 years on the road. And two years into that, I realized I was in big trouble. This was not what I wanted to be doing when I was 50. Because what they pay you for when you're a professional musician is moving one ton of equipment out of two vehicles onto a stage and then taking it off the stage later. The music is just to buy time until you move it back <laughs> off. Um, so it's a, it's a, and you get paid $50 a night. So I mean, it's a really hard life. So I started writing. I don't know why I picked that. Uh, but I started writing, and I wrote six to seven hours a day, seven days a week, for eight and a half years before I sold my first piece. I had written 11 scripts, multiple drafts of them, and I'd written three novels, multiple drafts of them, and my, my third sold. And the, 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 the joke to the story is, which happens to be real, is I sold that one, and I'd written, I think, six drafts of it. Maybe even eight. It was a, it was, I think it was eight. It was a lot of drafts to that one that sold. And I was a published author, and they were going to do it hardcover. And they were going to pay me enough to buy a bicycle. Um, but I got the call from the editor, and we had a little bit of chit-chat, you know, because I, I didn't know him. And, and then I said, so let's talk book. And he said, well, I only have two problems with the book, the premise and the ending. The entire book. <laughs> I had to start the book all over with a new premise and a new ending. I don't know what he liked about it, so I wrote it another four times, and it got published. So it, it was the school of hard knocks for me. Yes? How did you come up with the idea of Story Ming? Do you mean the name or the character? She's my daughter. My daughter is Story Ming Pearson. So she's in the book. Uh, but that's how I came up with her. I, uh, I wanted to bring a particular character in, and I thought, since, since my other daughter reads all my books and stories never read any, I thought, I'm going to put her name in the book. Now she'll read my books. Nope. <laughs> Completely failed at that one. In the, in the back. If Disney were to make real life and you try holograms, what would be your reaction to that? Well, I have a way for them to do it. I actually have the technology worked out to do it. And one of the things we're talking about um, is installing a... Um, it's not an attraction. It would be a... Uh, uh, I'm not exactly sure what you'd call it, a display. It would be like a Kingdom Keepers display in Disneyland. There's some talk about that. Um, but I have two different ways they could do it right now. Uh, they couldn't move around the park, but they could be there when you came in and greet you um, in the daylight and know what you're wearing and be able to talk to you and do the whole bit, and you could just swipe your hand right through them. I, um, when I was trying to conceive of all this and win their permission, uh, they, I, at a, a seminar I was going to, I saw this sort of salad bowl thing with a lid, and it has a hole in it. You can get these things on the internet for like $15. And they put a little plastic pig down in it, but the plastic pig sits up top, and it's as hard looking as this. So on the break, I went up to pick up the pig, and it was a hologram. This thing doesn't plug in. It just works off of natural light. The thing looks totally real. And that moment that I pinched, I went, I know how to make the Kingdom Keepers so the attorneys will approve it. Because they wouldn't let anything happen in the parks bad. No sabotage, no weapons, no anything to their rides. Nothing could happen to a kid, God forbid. And yet they wanted me to write a thriller. 
So I had to figure out a way to make the kids bulletproof, basically. And when I pinched that pig, I went, I've got it. And they became holograms. But since then, I found out some very cool things. So we have a uh, question from an internet. We have a question from the internet. From the internet, Zach from the blog. Zach from the blog. Okay. Uh, what is your most memorable of any of your Disney experiences? What is my most memorable of any Disney experience? Um, that's so hard. Every single experience, as you guys all know, every time you go in the parks, you see them differently. I mean, how can they do this? That's what I want to know. I've been in the park. You guys, I'm sure, have been in the parks more than I have. I've been in the parks 30, 40 times. They're always different, and they're always great. And, you know, I'm not just singing their song because I like the company. I'm amazed at it. Um, some of the scariest part was certainly seeing those dolls move in, in Small World. And since then, I had a radio host, an interview, an interviewer, tell me off mic that he had been in there one time at permission of the company, and he had seen four of the dolls move. And, you know, there are, I'm sure you guys have heard these, there are all these legends and rumors that surround the park that are right on the creepy side, and they're really fun. Um, some of the more interesting moments was being in the Utilidors, uh, which are the big tunnels underneath Magic Kingdom. Being in the engine room of the ship was unbelievable. But I have been scared multiple times, multiple ways, which is all I really do uh, when I write the books, is I try to go out, have experiences, and then go, wow, and go back and write about them. Uh, the only thing that's really hugely made up is um, Escher's Keep, and I hope someday they will build Escher's Keep, because I think it would be really cool. Uh, one or two more before we all boil. Yes? Who's your favorite character in the series? Who's my favorite character in the series? Do you have a mom and a dad? Which is your favorite? <laughs> oh, she answered. Nobody ever answers that. Um, I have, you know, I have a personal stake in every character that's in there. I, I, when I was on Splash Mountain and they gave me the tour of Splash Mountain, it was dry. It wasn't turned on, which is a weird thing to see. And uh, I walked the whole thing with this guy with white hair who knew everything there was to know about Disney and Disney World. And he was just an astonishing encyclopedia of Disney. And I said to this guy at the end, of, when you turn on the ride, by the way, 5,000 gallons a minute. Um, and I said to him, you know, I've written about half this book, and there's a character in it named Fred. And I'm having this feeling right here that I should change his name to your name because you're really the guy I've been looking for. Would that be okay with you? And he said yes. And what name was he wearing? Wayne. So up until about three days from now, uh, for the last nine years, because he's retiring in about three days, if you go on Splash Mountain, there will be a, a white-haired great guy who's putting you on and wearing the badge. And I have had hundreds of emails from young and older people saying, I just met Wayne from the Kingdom Keepers. <laughs> because when you meet him, the kids will go, are you Wayne from the Kingdom Keepers? And he goes, Heck yes, and he carries a Sharpie and he signs their map. It's really good. So that's been one of those great interfaces of reality and uh, fiction. One last one, yeah. Where did I? The plot twist with Story Mang in book? Oh, in book seven. I can't talk about book seven because some people are still going to read it. Listen, thank you so much. I hope you'll keep a lookout next year for the first book of The Return, which some of you will understand. And I'm going to sign books now. Thank you for coming. <laughs>